Bungie was back this week with their weekly news dump for this week at Bungie. We've got some more details about the Solstice of Heroes 2021 Master Mode coming to the Vault of Glass and also Time Lost Weapons 2. That's all coming next week. Plus, we've got some really big updates coming to the Sandbox, which is really going to mix up that meta very, very nicely indeed. Well, if you're new around here or find this useful, don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below for all the latest Destiny 2 content and turn on notifications by hitting that bell. Well, Bungie kicked off their update on the 1st of July 2021 by saying, This week at Bungie, we prepare for the Solstice of Heroes 2021. So it's almost time for a celebration earlier in the week. Guardians push back against the Endless Night, and through the relentless overrides and adventures to expunge in the Vex network, Curia was found and defeated. So while larger threats to humanity remain, one can take a moment to breathe and rest easy, knowing that the people of the last city are safer. In the wise words of Saint 4 team, it is time for a celebration, and Solstice of Heroes is the perfect moment for that. So there's going to be a big party in the tower, and that's not the only thing that's going on. So Eva Levante returns next week, bringing some new armor for hunters, titans, and warlocks to earn. So as you upgrade your sets, you once again be able to earn some magnificent white glows to adorn your armor with. And if you've got a taste for elements, Eververse will also offer the Universal Ornament Bundle for purchase, which will shine brightly with glows that reflect your equipped subclass. For a full rundown of Solstice of Heroes and everything coming, make sure to check out the seasonal event page on Bungie.net. And personally, I'm getting really excited for a fun new shotgun that is going to be available during that event. So next week has quite a bit going on. A larger than usual mid-season sandbox update. We've got the Vault of Glass Master difficulty and more, so let's dig in. Well, first up, we've got Fate Breakers. So raids fall squarely into the endgame space of Destiny, providing aspirational content for fire teams of six to conquer. So once you climb the mountain and planted your flag, you may find yourself asking, well, what's next? Well, I'm here today to let you know that you haven't submitted the mountain just yet. If you truly wish to call yourself a master of the Vault of Glass, you're going to be challenged to earn that respect. So beginning of Tuesday on the 6th of July, Vault of Glass Master Difficulty will become available to all players. So first up, we've got instructions of how to enter. So when signing in next Tuesday, Vault of Glass will offer a Master Difficulty option to launch for you and your fire team. And while there are no minimum power requirements to enter, enemies are going to be 1350 power so you will want to earn some pinnacle power and raise your artifact level before attempting a run. Next up, let's have a look at what you can earn. So first up, Master Vault of Glass unlocks final triumphs required for the Fate Breaker, Raid Seal and also the Title 2. So once completed, players may equip their in-game title and purchase the Bungie Rewards pin if they so desire. Well, second, Master Vault of Glass will also introduce time-lost weapons into Destiny 2. And time-lost weapons can be comparable to adept weaponry from Grandmaster Nightfalls or Flawless Trials packages, but offer an additional perk in columns 3 and 4 for slightly more customization. So complete Vault of Glass challenges in the master difficulty of the activity, and you will be rewarded. So each week, it's going to feature a specific time-lost weapon for you to hunt, rotating alongside the available challenge. And once you've earned a time-lost weapon, you may also purchase additional rolls from the chest at the end of the raid on Master Difficulty using the Spoils of Conquest. And note these will be a higher price than normal versions of these weapons. So please note, weekly reward lockouts are shared between both normal and Master Difficulties of Vault of Glass. So that means encounters, challenges and hidden chests will only reward gear the first time you complete them in either activity that week. They must be completed at Master Difficulty first to earn the Time Lost Weapons and also the stat-focused armor. And lastly, armor from the Master Difficulty version of the Vault of Glass will focus on specific stats, rotating weekly. So if you've been hunting a Prime Zealot Helm with a high spike in the Intellect stat, Master Difficulty will give you that greater chance for the distribution that you are looking for. Well, this won't be a walk in the park, and if you haven't dipped your toes into the Destiny endgame before, or well, enemies, they're going to be a lot tougher. They're going to be looking to put you down with more aggression, and a few more champions will be appearing to defend the vault. More modifiers will be active, forcing you to think on your feet, so come prepared. And if you're looking to increase your power, make sure you complete your weekly milestones for pinnacle rewards. And one way to do that is Iron Banner, and that is active right now, so make sure to complete those bounties for additional pinnacle rewards as you prepare for the raid. So Atheon will be seeing you next week, and good luck to all fire teams as they attempt their first Master Difficulty Raid. 
Well, next up, we got the big mid-season sandbox update. So over the last few seasons, we've seen some pretty big changes to the Destiny 2 sandbox. Aggressive hand cannons jumped straight into the spotlight of PvP. Rocket launchers became an awesome option for PvE content. And Dead Man's Tail started whistling in the wind and much more too. So over the last few months, the team has been working to prepare a mid-season sandbox pass much larger than the ones that we shipped in the past. So, so to give you all these details, weapons feature lead Chris Proctor has once again agreed to lend some time to the TWAB. So Chris says, hey all, Chris here. I'd first like to set some expectations and normally we wouldn't make some large changes in a mid-season patch, but with a handful of weapons sucking all the air out of the room, we decided to bring some changes originally planned from season 15 into next week's update. So we'll follow this up with a big set of changes in season 15 and moving these changes up to the season of the splicer also gives us the option of doing some reactive tuning in season 15's mid-season patch. So all in all, we'll continue to make changes outside these seasonal updates when we can, but they won't typically be this large or numerous. So without further ado, the big ticket items for PvP are no surprises, shotguns, 120 RPM aggressive hand cannons, and also Dead Man's Tail. So combined, these dominate all forms of PvP, particularly in Trials, and we've also been getting large amounts of feedback about special weapon usage in the Crucible, and this will be a first step towards addressing these players' concerns. So okay, we also can't forget about the Sleeper Simulator in PvE too. Well, first up, we've got to look at the intended special weapon roles in PvP. So most special weapons should have one situation where they are a dominant choice, and if caught outside this, you should be at a disadvantage. Moving towards these roles is a work in progress and some weapons are not where we want them to be and we've made some changes in Season of the Splicer that we expect to need more adjustments later on. And note that special ammo abundance in PvP distorts these roles so allowing play that wouldn't be possible otherwise and it's something we're looking to address. So here are the roles we intend for each special weapon to fill. So first up we've got sniper rifles to engaging at long range with aiming skill when you're not already under fire. Next we've got shotguns, so engaging at point blank range, using skill at movement or positioning to get close enough to get a one or two hit elimination. Then we've got fusion rifles, so engaging at mid range, but be careful with positioning and pre-charging around cover required for success. We've got trace rifles, so strong at close to mid ranges, at the cost of not being a one hit elimination, making it possible to be outplayed by skillful primary users. And then finally, we've got grenade launchers, so useful for weakening an opponent, getting damage around the corners with bounces or getting one-hit eliminations with direct impact at the cost of projectile travel time and being in a bad place if you miss your shot with a single round magazine. Well, shotguns are very dominant in PvP by any measure and don't allow much counterplay with primary weapons, particularly close-range primaries like sidearms and SMGs. And we frequently see player feedback about the prevalence in PvP activities and how they make it difficult to use various weapon archetypes and otherwise feel good against players without shotguns. So we want them to excel in a narrower niche than they do currently. So this change aims to retain the reliable one-hit eliminations but at a closer range and push them to be slightly rangier than currently at getting two-hit eliminations. So as with our intent for all special weapons, if a player is caught out of position with a shotgun, they should be at a clear disadvantage. So with the ability to quickly follow up rising in importance, we expect faster firing shotguns to eat into the aggressive shotgun's dominance and other special weapons to be more viable. So increase the aggressive frame shotgun cone angle from 4.0 to 4.25 degrees and reduce the shotgun damage fall off minimum by 2 meters. And increase the shotgun damage fall off by a maximum of 2 meters and note slug shotguns are unaffected by this change. Next up we've got the aggressive 120 RPM hand cannons and they've been adjusted in Season of the Splicer already, but it didn't make enough of a difference, and we believe they're still too rangy and benefit way too much from a small damage buff, e.g. two tapping. It's tricky because they're now not much different from their pre beyond light -like form, they already had better range with a two-tap rampage, but people have latched onto their ease of two and two tapping potential since the buff in Beyond Light and now new 120s in Season of the Chosen encourage people to try them out. So with this change, we expect other primaries to become viable, where previously 120s ate their lunch, including adaptive hand cannons, pulse rifles, scout rifles and auto rifles, while allowing 120s to keep their advantage of hard-hitting, peak shooting at range. So reduced precision damage multiplier from 1.8 to 1.6, preventing that 10% damage bonus from allowing two tapping in PvP. Reduced aim assist minimum falloff distance by 1 to 2 meters, depending on the range stat. 
and reduce damage minimum fall off distance by one meter and this reduces their damage fall off advantage over other hand cannons to one meter as usual this is one meter before the zoom scaler and Bungie have also changed a few perks as well so drop mag that can no longer roll on new drops of weapons and we will have functionality change later on so there is a change that's coming next season that requires adjusting this and some perks with similar functionality but more on that later so we've got pulse monitor, so fixed an issue where the handling bonus was no longer applying. And also rewind rounds, so fixed an issue where the perk would not trigger if the last shot in the magazine missed, or the player reloaded another weapon before firing the final shot. And finally, reservoir burst, we've seen the complaints that the detonation on kills doesn't feel that reliable or impactful, so this has been updated with the same consistency as the speed fix as Dragonfly. So following on from that, two exotics will get some tuning, so Deadman's Tail is dominant on mouse and keyboard and receives frequent critical feedback from players in the Crucible and is strong but not worryingly so on controller. So we're keeping the fast firing on the hip which we believe is the key to the feel of the weapon but with this change it will no longer have the ADS level of damage fall off while hip firing so will be subject to fall off much closer. And it's also going to require better aim to land hits while hip firing and we're deliberately only lightly touching the ease of use in this change with the goal of not making it harder to use on controller. So they've removed the hip fire damage fall off scaler and it was 1.8 to match the zoom and the aim assist cone angle hip scaler reduced from 1.5 to 1.2. Sleeper Simulant didn't receive any custom tuning when we updated linear fusion rifles or the LFRs but because it had much higher body damage than other LFRs it didn't benefit as much as intended from the global buff to the precision damage scaler. So Sleeper will now be the clear winner for the single shot LFR damage and edge out other LFRs for burst damage and largely match others for total damage from reserves. Also note that Sleeper's penalty for hitting the body rather than the head is much lower, giving it an edge in the real world damage. So fix an issue where Sleeper Simulant was benefiting less from other LFRs from the Season of the Splicer LFR precision damage buff. So the total buff is now 16.5% compared to 15% buff on other LFRs received. So that is what's coming soon, but we've got some news on the near future too. We have more changes than usual coming for Season 15, some as follow-ups to the above and others that were too large for mid-season. Here's a preview of some of the changes and of course expect a new batch of weapons and perks. So we've got fusion rifles and we've been wanting to tackle the subfamily differentiation for a while, so we're planning on a large rework of fusion rifles, changes to fusion rifle perks and mods, and also custom tuning to most exotic fusion rifles. So for example, is Vex Mythoclast a fusion rifle? Let's say yes. So we've got breach grenade launchers, so with the above shotgun changes, we expect other special weapons to increase in usage, and believe that grenade launchers have the potential to become more frustrating to play against as they become slightly more common. So we're planning a small change that specifically touches priming and cleaning up targets. We've got scout rifles and hand cannons in PvE, so players have wanted these weapons to be a little bit more efficient in PvE for some time. And we found that minor enemies in the high end content take too many shots to kill with these weapons. We've got machine guns in PvE, so through playtesting and player feedback, we found they're not doing their intended job well enough, so we're planning a noticeable change in Season 15. We've got the special ammo economy, particularly in PvP, so while the above changes to shotguns should help tone down the aggressive frames a little bit, we got a couple of changes planned that should reduce the amount of special ammo floating around to a degree and have further changes in mind in case they are needed. Anarchy has done too much too well for too many years without even counting the boost it's gotten this season which is due to the Sweet Grenade Launcher's artifact mods. So we're making changes that make it great for a couple of roles rather than being the jack of all grenade launchers. And finally we got exotic primaries so we want to give players more reasons to use the exotic primary weapons in high end PvE content and have changes coming to help with this. And then Bungie go into details about the more distant future, so we're going to keep a close eye on special weapons and make adjustments once we see how they perform in the wild, particularly fusion rifles and grenade launchers. So we do have an idea of what may need more adjustments as these changes shake out, but we'll wait to discuss them as our plans solidify. We'll also keep a close eye on feedback on exotic weapons and which weapons are under or overperforming. We do have some tweaks planned next week in Season 15 and also beyond which is shake things up. Note that we specifically look at catalysts as a way to buff underuse exotics. For example, this is why we made catalysts for Trinity Ghoul and a Deathbringer, so expect similar reasoning moving forward. 
At the risk of being vague, we also have some long-term plans to address the issue of exotic orb generation and kill trackers without making a catalyst for every exotic in the game. Well, there you have it. As Chris mentioned, there's a bit of a meaty mid-season update, so while the patch note list isn't as long as you've seen, the impact of these changes is expected to be higher than the usual mid-season patch. Don't expect changes on this scale in the middle of every season, but the team worked hard to get these together and out the door. Trying out some of these changes in playtest have been really, really fun, and we're expecting a bit of a shake-up to the meta, at least in terms of shotgun usage. Some shotguns will still be fairly lethal, but are going to require a closer range for those sweet one-hit eliminations. As always, we'll be watching your feedback as these changes go live, and planning changes as necessary. Well, finally today, we've got another patch note preview, so alongside the sandbox update, there's a slew of bug fixes going out with the Destiny 2 update 3.2.1. So here is a quick list of some of the high priority changes to expect next Tuesday when your patch hits your hard drive. So first of all we've got Expunge, so Sticks fixed an issue where the Code Striker platform over the boss would fail to have collision in certain circumstances. And Tartarus, well first of all we've got the same as above and then fixed an issue where defeating the boss before the second immunity phase would block the mission completion. Well that is a really good one, I got locked out of the mission completion last week and it's really really frustrating. Well, next up we've got Strikes, so we've got the Inverted Spire. Fix an issue where players who died in the drill area could have their ghost appear far back in the strike. And the ghost now appears at a set safe location in the drill area. We've got Momentum Control, so decrease the Trace Rifle damage in Momentum Control. So while we know that Trace Rifles are too hot, we're also aware that some players are greatly enjoying the laser tag in Momentum Control right now. So with that in mind, we're starting out with a small change to see how that feels before taking another pass. Well finally we've got some gameplay changes, so fix an issue which slow duration from Withering Blade did not increase the Whisper of Durance fragment equipped. And fix an issue in which Stormcrawler or Warlock were unable to use Ionic Blink while slowed by Stasis. And fix an issue in which Diamond Lance could be generated by throwing a Glacier Grenade into a pile of Telesto projectiles. And finally fix a few bugs in which abilities were not properly costing Sentinel Shield energy when guarding, so Celestial Fire, Withering Blade, Shiver Strike, Glacial Quake and also Silence and Squall. So loads and loads of changes to be excited about there. We've got the Master Mode in the Vault of Glass coming. We've got all those Sandbox updates and we've got the Solstice of Heroes too. So it's going to be a really, really busy week next week in Destiny 2. Loads and loads of stuff. But let me know down in the comments what you think of all those Sandbox changes. And also, are you going to dive into the Master Mode of the Vault of Glass? Well, as always, thank you so much for watching. And for more Destiny 2 content like this, hit that subscribe button down below and subscribe to This Week in Video Games. If you want to join the community, check out the Discord link in the description, or you can follow me on Twitter at TWIVG Podcast. If you enjoyed this video, found it useful, liking and sharing the video would really help me out. Otherwise, check out the other videos on the channel. Thanks again. See you soon.